Welcome to AG 101. This is an overview of the Office of State Attorney General, an institution which is growing in importance with every year within our legal framework. My name is Jim Tierney. I had the honor of being the Attorney General of my home state of Maine for 10 years. And since that time, I have consulted with Attorneys General, read about them, worked with them, uh, on both political parties, lectured widely, and today I'm a lecturer in law at Harvard Law School. I previously taught at both Columbia and Yale Law School. Now this overview is my views, okay? So uh, there are gonna be plenty of people disagree with me, and obviously one state will differ from another state on some of the issues. But there is a certain connection among them. And uh, this sort of 15 minute description uh, will hopefully um, shed some light for those who are not familiar with the Office of a State Attorney General. Now, for more information, go to the nag.org. It's the, it's the website of the National Association of Attorneys General. It's a great source. And I have my own website, stateag.org, AG101, which you might want to take a look at as well. We are the United States of America. We've been put together with the states as being the primary legal institution that delivers goods and services and looks out for the welfare of the people of our country. And every state has a lawyer, and that lawyer is the state attorney general. Now, this office didn't arise overnight. It came out of the 1600s in, in England as a creature of the common law where people felt a little bit uncomfortable with giving too much power to the king. And so every colony had an attorney general and all of every state brought a state attorney general along with them. And now every state in the District of Columbia has an attorney general. Um, but unlike the federal government, where our founding fathers wanted the attorney general to be under the control and under the thumb of the president, only two states, only two states, Alaska and Wyoming, allow an attorney general to be removed from office by the governor. And there's a reason for that. The reason is this sort of suspicion that we don't want to give too much power to the executive. They will ignore the law, ignore the Constitution. So at its core, the Office of State Attorney General is designed to uphold the law and to be fair and balanced to everyone as they do that. Now, it's a difficult job. Plus, we have some additions. The attorneys general are all elected officials. Um, well, 43 of them are elected in partisan elections, but they're all partisan. They've all had political jobs before they became attorney general, and many of them have political jobs after they're attorney general. So um, you do have the partisan nature of what they do clearly impacting the nature of their decisions. That's what we call democracy. And um, those views are, on some issues, very significant and very divergent. So how are we gonna talk about this? Let's, let's divide the Office of Attorney General up and into three basic presentations, okay? Who are they? What do they do? And how do they do it? Okay, so let's start with, you know, who they are. Um, these men and women uh, have long since have experience in their judicial system, and they wouldn't have gotten this job in the first place. And so what is it that they do? Well, they divide their responsibilities up into two areas, civil and criminal. On the civil side, the state attorney general represents state agencies. It's the lawyer for the state agencies. So that means they advise them, they give guidance, they draft regulations, they enforce certain laws, and they also tell the agency, and this is why an AG is independent, that the agency sometimes just can't do something that they want to do. There's a deliberate friction between the Office of Attorney General and their civil clients. Now, a lot of people who don't like that. Sometimes the legislature doesn't like that. Sometimes the agency doesn't like that. And so this becomes a push back against the Office of Attorney General and increasingly agencies and, uh, and sometimes the legislature are actually showing up in court to litigate because the basic law in virtually every state that only the AG can go into court. Assistant AGs could do that. So let's take a look at the criminal side. All right, the criminal side is we have three states, um, Alaska, Delaware, and Rhode Island. 
where the AG is the exclusive prosecutor. There are no district attorneys. But everywhere else, it's a mix. The AG has some criminal jurisdiction. Maybe they handle the appeals. Maybe they handle conflicts when a, when a DA can't handle a case. Um, uh, and sometimes they're just the spokesperson around criminal justice issues. So all AGs have some level of criminal jurisdiction. And in the popular mind, because the AGs are statewide, the public expects them to take positions on criminal justice matters. Now this becomes really complicated. We're seeing now situations where district attorneys from rural areas really do not agree with district attorneys from urban areas and the AG is involved with that. AGs are increasingly asked to look into police misconduct. Uh, obviously an issue of great importance to all of us because the idea of having local prosecutors look at issues involving police departments uh, is, is, is occasionally problematic. So people want to have someone from outside look at it. So an AG has really a lot of criminal jurisdiction and they have broad civil jurisdiction. But let me give you the next example. The jurisdiction of an AG isn't always written down. What are you talking about? It has to be written down, right? The lawyers, no. An AG can stand in a bully pulpit. And, and, and so let me try to give you an example. Let's assume an AG has no direct jurisdiction over the serious crime of domestic violence, that this is a matter handled by local law enforcement and the DAs. Does that mean an AG can't do anything on domestic violence? No, the AG can propose legislation, can instruct police officers at the Criminal Justice Academy, can appoint a task force, can work with advocacy groups, can work with attorneys general in other states, can sit down with the governor and see how can we put more resources into domestic violence. So the AG, when the AG does something outside their technical jurisdiction, this does not mean that they're just playing politics. It just means that they're an activist and AGs tend to be activists. They like to do stuff. They see a problem and they want to address it. So, well, they have the resources to do this, a pretty broad set of responsibilities here, right? Well, the largest state, not surprisingly, is California. They have 13, 1400 lawyers, they're civil service lawyers, and um, which means they serve, uh, they do not serve at the pleasure of the Attorney General. But most AG offices run between 200 and 300 lawyers. Some are getting pretty big up into the four and $500 uh, area, depending on the politics and the, and the eb ebbs and flows. So we're talking about a lot of lawyers. And these lawyers are career, overwhelmingly career lawyers. Now I mentioned the AGs are elected. They come and go. Sometimes they have term limits. But the, the vast bulk of assistant AGs do their job every day. They enforce the law. They're career people. As I said, they're not in it for the money. And so it's that careerism that creates an institution for the Office of Attorney General in the vitally important things that they have to do. Occasionally, the AGs have to use outside counsel. Sometimes it's a conflict of interest. Um, sometimes it's a rural area that the AG can't get his or her staff to in an efficient way. Um, sometimes the relationship with the client agencies has become so toxic uh, because of differing views. The AG thinks the law should be one thing and the agency thinks something else that they use outside counsel. And, and of course, AGs are increasingly using, for really big cases, uh, contingent counsel. These are private lawyers who actually get paid a percent of what they bring back for the state in a negotiated rate uh, for very large cases, oil spills, tobacco cases, um, groundwater violations, opioids, those kinds of issues, uh, outside counsel oftentimes are responsible for doing it. So how does an AG organize himself? The AG, it's not a democracy. The AG gets to decide, right, what to do, or maybe more important, what not to do. So how do the AG organize themselves? Well, they actually follow a pretty similar pattern from state to state. And I've got an organizational chart on this. If you look at the state AG, Dot org website, AG 101, you'll see a chart that a lot of people, including AGs, find pretty helpful, especially the new AGs. So an AG's functions are divided up in, as, as pretty much as follows, different titles in different states, but they're divided up. The most important lawyer, other than the Attorney General, is the Chief Deputy. Now, the Chief Deputy is 
politically aligned with the attorney general, but they're really a skilled lawyer and their job is to make sure that the whole office works in a consistent way, that the budget is kept. And sometimes it's the chief deputy who has to say no to the AG, no to the agencies, no to the positions of other states, no to the political parties. Chief deputy is a key person in all of this. Well, if the AG isn't gonna be, chief deputy isn't gonna be political, who is? Well, that's probably gonna be the chief of staff. Chief of staff may not even be a lawyer, or it could be a non-practicing lawyer. It could be someone who comes right off the campaign or out of the legislature. And their job is to run the communications team for the attorney general to make sure that the AG's message gets out and that the long-term vision of an attorney general is accomplished, right? I mean, AGs run for office. They tell the voters they're going to do something and they want to be able to do it. And it's the chief of staff which helps them do that. So you do see a natural conflict in many situations between the chief of staff, who's focusing on the outside external message and advocacy groups, and the chief deputy, who's focusing on how you run the office. Okay, who else do they have? Well, they've got a civil deputy. Civil deputy is someone, remember, you're representing all these agencies. The agencies get sued. It's the AG's office who defends. So somebody has to do that. And there are a lot of lawyers who do that. Most of the agency lawyers are actually funded by their agency clients. And so that civil director is oftentimes kind of uh, maybe a little curmudgeonly when he gets to staff meetings. Say, you can't do that, General. You can't do that, Consumer Chief. You can't do that because we're representing agencies that are involved in complex litigation and have been for years. And you can't take a position adverse to them. That's the civil that's the civil deputy. Okay, who comes next? How about the Solicitor General? Now, Solicitor General is really, in one way, just one more assistant AG. They report to the AG, they serve at the pleasure of the AG. But the Solicitor General is designed to be that part of the office, which makes sure that the office handles its appellate advocacy in a high quality way, in a way that's, that really meets the highest standards of the people of the state and also consistently because some agencies argue differently from one to another. So <clears throat> the Solicitor General, usually these are small offices within an AG's office, sometimes they're larger. But the Solicitor General also is the one who appears in court on the real big cases. Now states go in front of the US Supreme Court more often than any party other than the federal government. I'm gonna repeat that. States are in front of the United States Supreme Court on issues, the most important issues for all of us, more often than any other party except the federal government itself. It is in the Solicitor General's office that these critically important cases are vetted and argued. And so some of these cases have been pretty high profile, right? In the last couple of years, states have been involved in every major social issue of our time, and it is the Solicitor General or the Solicitor General's office who argue those cases and become quite prominent when in prior years they were pretty much invisible. All right, who else do you have? Well, here you have the criminal deputy. We talked about criminal law earlier. It's important for a criminal deputy to get along, not just with their own cases, because only the really big criminal cases come to the AG, uh, but also to try to mediate among the various district attorneys who, and that's becoming a very, very difficult job as DAs are, are, are seeing the world very, very differently. And the AG oftentimes, AG personally oftentimes has to decide which side he or she is gonna be on. This is an emerging issue, it's a big one, and it's close to watch. But the criminal deputy really has to be respected. When they say we're gonna bring a case or not bring a case, especially if you're dealing with uh, allegations of, 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 of police uh, uh, wrongdoings, you, you really have to have a credible person in that criminal division slot. Okay, finally, public protection. This is the AG's favorite division because the AG doesn't have to worry about client agencies or solicitor general or any of that. The Public Protection Bureau is consumer protection, it's antitrust, it's charities, in an increasing number of states, it's labor law enforcement. And so these important, vitally important areas of civil rights fall within public protection. And it's here where an attorney general really gets to take his or her view of the public interest and to litigate in ways that they feel make sense. Now, it's in the public protection division that a lot of these big multi-state cases happen where you get 
not just millions of dollars, sometimes billions, that's B, billions of dollars cases, like tobacco case, those kinds of things, handled out of the Public Protection Division. Now, in order to do that on a multi-state national basis, all the consumer protection lawyers know their counterparts in other states. So, as the same true with antitrust, same true with charities, they all know each other. And so therefore, when dealing with one of these really big consumer protection or antitrust cases, the AGs oftentimes work as, as if it was a single, as if it was a single law firm. So if an AG is gonna do things right, they have to make sure they get these key people all in the room at the same time, the chief deputy, the chief of staff, public protection, solicitor general, civil uh, deputy, criminal deputy, and then talk it through, and then the AG gets to decide all by himself or herself. If the AG doesn't get everybody in the room, they can make some real serious mistakes because they overlook a criminal aspect of it or, or a public protection aspect of it. They can really make mistakes. Mistakes do occur. And so one of my basic messages is you need your whole team in that room before you decide what you're going to do. Okay, there are some national organizations that deal with AGs. I'm just going to deal with three. By far the most important is the National Association of Attorneys General. This is a terrific organization. Virtually every state is a member. They, um, they're funded by dues and settlements. They are not funded by any corporate contributions. They are the infrastructure behind multi-state litigation that allows many of these meetings to happen. They bring all the chief deputies together so they all know each other. They bring all the solicitor generals together so they know each other. They have a lot of training that's done at the assistant AG level, training those 13, 14,000 assistant AGs to make sure that they're right at the top of their game. NAG is a great organization and it's something which is really worth following if you're at all interested inside the culture of how AGs work. So that's NAG, that's what it's called, National Association of Attorneys General. Uh, have you noticed I've kind of avoided talking about the politics here? Well, the politics, they're all Republicans or Democrats. Let's face it, they're all partisan. So they have their own organization, the Republican AGs Association, RAGA, and the Democratic organization, DAGA. These groups meet six times a year. That's a heavy time commitment for an attorney general to go meet with their political colleagues and also, of course, to meet with donors. There are a lot of donors, a lot of lobbyists will pack the halls of Raga and Daga meetings. And some of these lobbyists, let's face it, they give money, but they also command so-called dark money that flows into AG races, which are increasingly expensive. And so it is true, AGs will be meeting in partisan meeting halls with lobbyists for companies with whom they're litigating. That's the system. That's the way it works. They, no AG likes it, really. But with no campaign finance laws really on the books, is so, and every race becoming more and more expensive, this is what happens. So it's concerning for all of us. The ethics makes you feel uncomfortable, makes everybody feel uncomfortable. That's the way it is. But the AGs themselves, I find, are really ethical, hardworking people. And their staffs, all the assistant AGs, they keep them on the straight and narrow. Now, finally, relationship with the federal government. Look. I started this talk by saying we are the United States of America. Our federal government provides trillions, that's right, trillions of dollars every state, every year, to every state in this country. And when that money goes into state government coffers for whatever purpose, education, environmental protection, whatever it's for, that money has to be done legally. And it's the career assistant AGs in all those offices who make sure that it's done well. And the fact that you don't read about it really means that it's being done well because we did not see, they really do a terrific job. So the core relationship between the states and the federal government is good, but you don't read about it. What do you read about? What you read about are the fights and there are a lot of them. It is now there is almost the accepted responsibility of every AG to fight the president if the president is not of their political party. To bring lawsuits and to file briefs and to go back and forth and to campaign against them. So if, if you're an AG and you, your guy is the president, 
then you're kind of expected to support them. And if it's not, you're really expected to be hostile. And a lot of those issues are huge. We're talking immigration. We're talking abortion. We're talking environmental protection. We are talking all across the board. And those fights get a lot of attention. And as I stated earlier, a lot of those fights end up in the United States Supreme Court, argued by the state solicitor general. So how am I doing? I kind of give you the basic outlines of what an attorney general is. Thanks for hanging in there with me. There are texts of these remarks which are attached to this video on stateag.org 101 website. Thanks for being with us. Class is over. Case dismissed. Thanks for coming.